Hello! In this video, I'm going to be showing you how I fixed a script error in the game Operation Save. Um, I am creating this video because I offered uh, to someone uh, to show them, how, like walk them through how I fixed this uh, script error. Uh, so basically, the target audience for this video is anyone who is into like flash game hacking, and so they already know like uh, how to use, for example, JPEXS or however you're meant to say that, um, and so they already know like some programming concepts, uh, and so I don't, I'm not going to be explaining like basic programming stuff. Um, but they aren't familiar with like Director or Shockwave or anything. Uh, how to how to hack around with that, uh, and so that's what I'm going to be showing, and it would be helpful for this to have some like programming experience uh, with some other programming language, right? Especially um, like JavaScript uh, would be helpful because uh, Lingo it's kind of similar to JavaScript in, in many ways. It's dynamically typed. It has some object-oriented concepts, so you'll feel very at home with it, even though you know the way it looks is quite different. It's, it's actually pretty conceptually similar. Uh, and so... <clears throat> That's the target audience for this video. If you're just someone who wants to create your own director applications or games, uh, this video is not really going to be useful for you. It's not going to contain anything super insightful. Um, it's it's mainly just if you if you want to um, if you're interested in like director hacking, right? So that's what I'm going to show. So <clears throat> the game in question is called Operation Save. And first, I'm just going to run it, and I'm going to show what the bug is uh, that we're going to try and fix. So let me just run this normally. Alright, I'm just going to skip over this intro cutscene stuff. So right away, we get this issue, uh, which says, Cannot divide by zero. We can hit OK on it. We can kind of keep going, but then it just kind of occurs every once in a while like this. Yeah, see, it's just going to keep happening. Okay, so I'm closing out of that. So that's the bug, and that's the only information that we get is cannot divide by zero, right? Just when we run it normally. So <clears throat> I'm going to go... The first step with any of this is to just get the Shockwave movie so that we can use it. So I'm going to go into uh, my Flashpoint data folder, and then into games, and this is just a fresh install of Flashpoint, so this is the only game that I have, right, but you could, uh, you know, if you had just downloaded this, go up here to date modified, and then be the most recent, and then go in here, uh, I just keep digging down subfolders until there is our Shockwave movie. So I'm just going to copy-paste this into somewhere I can edit it. So I'm going to go into my director games folder, which is kind of a mess, uh, but I'm just going to paste it in here. And then we're going to use projector rays. Uh, so I'll have a link to this in the description. Projector rays is a uh, Shockwave movie decompiler. So I'm just going to click and drag this onto projector rays, which if you have the latest version, that will work. And it's going to produce a new file with a different file type extension. So the original had a DCR file type extension. This one has a DIR file type extension. Um, so this has now been uh, converted to a director movie. So now I'm going to double click on this to open it in director. And that's going to open in the version of director I have installed, which is director MX2004. Now, this is generally the version that you want to use for most things. Uh, sometimes you'll need a newer version, sometimes you'll need an older one, but for this particular game, I happen to know this is already the correct version. So we have it open, <coughs> and now what we want to do is we want to figure out uh, which script that this error occurs in. And really the easiest way to do that is to trigger the bug in director. But if we just go up here and hit play, we get a script error right away that is clearly not the same one. So <clears throat> I'm just going to cancel out of that. 
Um, so this is not really the main point of the video, but I've already traced this back and I already know what causes this. So if we hop in here to the first script called RD Tools and we scroll way down, um, what we find is that they have actually, so the author of this movie has basically programmed in a convenience feature where if the run mode is author, which it now is because we're running this in director, right? So this is only true when we're running this in director uh, that the run mode is going to be author, right? The run mode just represents like which player is being used to play this uh, movie. So in director, it'll be author in, you know, the... Uh, in the browser, it'll be plugin. In the projector, it'll be projector, right? Uh, so now it's author because we're running this in director. And they've basically programmed in a convenience feature for themselves where uh, they will scan through the text of every script in the movie and look for a comment at the beginning of it that says the version number of that script. And then if it's not up to date, uh, then it'll warn them that, that the script is not up to date. So it's basically like their own versioning system, right, that they've just programmed in there for themselves during development. And this all falls apart uh, because Projector Rays is a decompiler, right? It's uh, the script, you know, was compiled, and when it was compiled, all the comments from it were stripped out. So now when we decompile it again, all the comments that set the version number of the script, those are all gone. So this whole system doesn't work. Right. So what I'm going to do now, I'm actually going to close out a director. I'm not going to save the changes because I'm concerned, right? I haven't really read this code, but I'm just concerned that it's potentially self-modifying, right? So I'm just going to hit no and not save any of those changes. And we're going to open this again. <clears throat> so this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the message window, which if it's not open for you, you just have to go to window message, right, this here, that'll open the message window, and I'm just going to type in set the run mode plugin, um, set the run mode plugin, right, and this is, this will work because I have the uh, leech protection removal hub extra installed, so this will work the same as an SPR, and now uh, when we run this game in director, it will be running as if the run mode we're plugging, right? So let's see that in action now and hit play. And you can see that it, uh, it works. So let's go ahead and hit play game and try and trigger the bug. Okay, so <clears throat> what just happened now is we can see that this director just popped open this script window, and um, when this happens, it usually means, uh, because, right, normally it'll actually tell you specifically which line the error occurred on, but it didn't. It just gave us this script window, so it's somewhere in this script, but it didn't, didn't give us a particular line. This is usually because the game has some sort of custom exception handler, right, that they've installed uh, to try and do something custom whenever an error occurs. Um, so what we're going to do, whenever you're debugging a director movie like this, um, <clears throat> what you always want to do is hit the rewind button. That will reset the movie back into a uh, valid state, right? And now we're going to hit play again. This time, we're going to turn off any sort of like custom exception handling so that uh, it'll just break into the debugger. So to do that, I'm going to type into the message window the alert hook equals zero. That's going to turn off any sort of custom exception handling for this game. So now let's hit play, skip all this stuff. Ah, now we get an actual error message, cannot divide by zero. So let's hit debug. So, um, now we've actually broken into the debugger, but the error location doesn't actually make any sense, 
because we can see it's highlighted this end if line, but obviously we can't have a cannot divide by zero error on an end if line of code. So what the reason for this is actually because of a bug in project arrays. Project arrays does not translate the like particular bytecode instruction into which line of code it's supposed to correspond to correctly. Uh, and so in order to fix this, we just need to force a recompile of the script. So all we need to do is just modify it in some way. So I'm just going to add a comment at the start, like projector rays, right? And then all we need to do is come up here and hit this lightning bolt, bolt icon uh, to recompile all modified scripts. And it doesn't really look like anything has happened, but uh, just because we've changed the text of the script and then hit that button, now it has been recompiled. So now let's go rewind again, and we'll trigger the bug again. And um, we have to remember to turn the alert ho hook off again, so I'm just going to hit enter on this line again. Now we're getting a, a message that makes more sense. So we hit debug, and here is the actual line the error is occurring on. So <clears throat> we can see that the line the error occurring, is occurring on is this one. It's current FPS equals the max of either 1 or 1,000 divided by milliseconds minus last and s. So just reading this, um, you know, you can pretty much theorize what's going on. Um, why this would be a divide by zero. This game was designed for like older computers that were pretty slow, and so it was a reasonable assumption that every time that this handler is called, at least one millisecond is going to have passed, right? And so every time that this that this handler is called, um, this is not going to be zero because at least one millisecond will have passed, and so the last milliseconds, which we stored, you know some previous time that this was called, right, it, it'll be um, a long time ago. And so the milliseconds minus last MS, it'll be some, you know, larger number than zero. Uh, and now that we're running this game on, like, a modern machine that is faster, right, this is apparently being called often enough that now uh, not, no, basically no time has elapsed since the previous time this was called. And so this is zero, right, no time has passed. Uh, and so we do a divide by zero. Now, <clears throat> you could easily picture, right, we could we could fix this pretty easily, right? If we just did something like last ms equals the minimum of either last ms or the milliseconds. The milliseconds, by the way, is like the current time in milliseconds, right? Uh, so the milliseconds minus one, right? This is just something that's built into director that allows you to get the current time, right? It's just a keyword. Uh, so you can just use the milliseconds to get the current time, right, in milliseconds. <clears throat> so if we did something like this, right, then this would consistently work, right, because um, we would ensure that if, you know, last MS were to be equal to the milliseconds, uh, then it, it would pick this value instead. It would pick the milliseconds minus one. Uh, and so we would ensure that at least one millisecond had passed since the previous time, it, you know, recorded that this was called, and then this would never be a divide by zero, right? <clears throat> um, now, at this point, we could just go to file, save, and we could save this out, uh, and then we could replace the file in the curation, but we really don't want to do that for several reasons. Um... Flashpoint is an archive, uh, and so we really want to keep the original files if possible. We don't want to create, like, hacked, modified versions of things. Um, if it turned out that this hack was not enough, then somebody would need to come in here in director, and they would need to know that this was the line that was added, that this was the patch, right? And then they would need to add, you know, their own hack on top of the hack, right? So <clears throat> that's not really ideal. Um, and also... 
this is a director movie now, not a shockwave movie, right? We turned it into one with projector rays. And so this has all been decompressed from the shockwave movie, right? This is uncompressed now, so it's much larger, right? It's like basically double the size, so it's going to increase the amount of time that it would take to download, which for some games is a big deal, right? Uh, like uh, Burn and Rubber is like 100 megabytes uncompressed or something like that, and it's like 10 in a shockwave movie. Uh, so are that going to make a significant difference? And you could decide to go instead to file publish and then uh, recompress this to a Shockwave movie. The problem with that is Shockwave movies, um, it's a lossy format, right? Uh, and so <clears throat> if we recompress it, all of the images are JPEG, all of the sounds are MP3. They're all going to get compressed again, and then we're going to have like a third generation compressed movie, which is not, not really ideal either. So... Basically, we don't want to replace the file at all. What we really want to do is we want to put our patch into the launch command of the game because that makes it, you know, uh, easier to maintain. You know exactly what has been modified and we can, you know, you can go in and change it if you have to, right? And, and we still get to keep the original files. It just is done on the fly in memory, right? <clears throat> so that's what we want to do. The problem is, right that in the original movie, in Flashpoint, all of this text doesn't exist, right? Projector Rays decompiled this script and created all this text, but uh, we can't just go in and edit this in the original movie because none of this exists there. It's a compiled script, right? Um, so <clears throat> what you would have to do is you would have to come in here, copy-paste this. You would have to add, like, a new script text command, paste this, Right, and then add another one, and, and paste the next line. And you would have to do that for every line in the script, and it would be just long and horrible and, and terrible, right? That's, that's, at that point, you know, you might as well just make a wrapper movie. And you could make a wrapper movie. Uh, that is a valid solution here, but we can actually do even better. In order to understand um, the actual solution that I went with, we really need to understand a basic fundamental thing about lingo, right? And this is a really important thing. Like, if I were ever to make more videos along these lines, uh, this is, like, something that comes up over and over again. So you really want to make sure you know this, right? So I'm going to go and create a, a new script just as an example, right? And I'm going to create one with the same event. So on enter frame, the... And I'm not going to really do anything of substance. I'm just going to log I am a jelly donut to the message window. Okay. So <clears throat> if you go over here in the on the right side to the property inspector in the script tab script tab here, it displays the type of this script. And there are three to choose from. So the first type is movie. Um, now a movie script, the way it works, it's really simple. Um, if you have an enter frame event like this, right, no matter where you are in the entire movie, when that event goes off, when the enter frame event is fired, um, this will get called. So no matter where we are in the entire movie, um, the enter frame event, if there, if, you know, if there is, if that event happens, right, then this event handler will get called, right? Really simple. Um, <clears throat> if this is a behavior script. Now, the only time that the event, that the enter frame event, uh, will trigger this handler is if our playhead is over it in the score. So I'm just going to find this script in the cast. There it is. That that's the script that I created. Uh, so I'm just going to click and drag this into the score, like this timeline view here. Which, if you don't see it, you can go to window score, right, to bring it up. Um, so this is the score for this movie, right? This is like the sort of timeline view. And you can see I've just clicked and dragged the script into it. So now, right, if we were just playing this movie, the only time that this script would receive an enter frame event is if our playhead was over it. And then after that, it would not, it would not be active anymore. So it would not receive that event anymore. Or, alternatively, if there's a sprite in the score that has this script attached, which you can do, right? You can come in here and attach the script, which I didn't give it a name. I can I can give it a nice name, like, uh, you know, Jelly Donut. 
right? Uh, and then I can come in here and find it, right? Right, so there's Jelly Donut. I could attach it to this sprite, and now when our playhead is over that sprite in, in the score, then that will also trigger the, the enter frame event, right? So basically, behavior scripts, right, you need to be over their, their sprite in the score um, for them to uh, for them to receive the, the event. Uh, now, this is already a slight oversimplification, right, because actually, with a movie script, um, it'll only receive the enter frame event if there isn't a behavior script receiving it, right? So it's either one or the other, right? So if there's a behavior script in the score that has an enter frame event, uh, then this script will not receive it. Whereas if there is no other script receiving it, then this one will. So it's it, only one thing can get the enter frame event, right? But uh, that's generally, you know, the gist of it. That's how it works, right? So then what is a parent script? Well, a parent script... Um, in order for a parent script to work, we actually have to insert something else before. Okay, so a parent script, the way that a parent script works is that this enter frame uh, handler, it will never be automatically triggered by director. It'll never be like implicitly called. The only way to call this enter frame handler is if we have another script. So let's say that this script is a, a behavior script, right? Okay, so basically, right, in order to call the enter frame method of the jelly donut script now, because it's a parent script, the only way to do it is to uh, create the jelly donut object and then to call the method on the object, right? So basically, oh, whoops, uh, let me get my other script back, right? Uh, this is a um, this is a class now. Right, like this is this is how you do object-oriented stuff in Lingo. Right, if your script is a parent script, then you can create an object out of out of it, and then you can call methods on the object. Right. So now, if we go back to our time control script, we can see that the type of this script is parent. So this enter frame handler, right, it has to be called explicitly somewhere. It would never be called implicitly by director. And indeed, if we just do a control F um, and I search for time control, which is the name of the script, right, we can see um, that it gets created here in this script called game world. Oh, and this is just an, an alternate way of, of writing the, um, the, it's just an alternate syntax for creating an object, right? So um, the following two things, right? If I do time control equals new script. Or if I do right, these two these two statements are are equivalent to each other. They just they do the same thing. It's just an alternate way of writing it. Um, uh, and so the decompiler here has just de decided to decompile it like this. But you could write it either way, right? <clears throat> and also, um, the time control script, it takes in an argument in its constructor. So if we look back at the time control script, we can see that it says uh, that its constructor has on new me, and then it has an argument called SPS. Right, and so this is just, um, you know, this is just like it just takes in an argument to its constructor, and that's why there is the number one hundred and twenty there. So if I go back to game world where this is nude, right? It's nude, and then it takes in that argument to its constructor, right? And then if I just uh, look again for enter frame, here we can see. That indeed, yes, this is where time control .interframe is called, and it's called in another handler called enter frame. 
But game world, this time, it's a behavior script, right? So this has to be in the score somewhere. And indeed, if we go in, if we just like right click on the game world script here in the uh, cast window, and we choose find and score, that's where it is. So it's just like attached as a behavior to, to this sprite. So whenever the playhead is over this sprite, then director is going to fire the enter frame event. This is going to receive it, and then this calls uh, that that calls enter frame the enter frame method on the time control object that was created before, right? Um, so that's how this is working, right? So <clears throat> with that in mind, let's now look at the launch command that I created and see if we can figure out how that solution works. So this is the launch command, and I'm just going to format this so that uh, you know it looks all nice, so that we can actually see what it does. So I'm going to remove all the noise from the all the sort of noise from the command line. Okay, so this is what the script actually looks like if you you know sort of beautify it. And, and format it out. So <clears throat> the first thing that we do is this um, dash dash do command, which is going to find the 12th member, which is the number of the uh, time control member, and uh, rename it to time control with an underscore in front of it. So that would be like if we came in here to director, here's our time control script, right? I'm going to go to its name and insert an underscore in front. Now remember, right, that game world script from before, right, it's looking for a script called time control without an underscore in front. So if we ran this now, it would not be able to find this script and it would just cause an error, right, because we've renamed it to something else. Um, but that's not all we do, so let's continue. So <clears throat> now we use the new script name and new script type commands to create a new script called time control, which is a parent script. So let's go in here, create a new script, and call it time control. And it's already set to be a parent, so that's good. So we've just created a new blank script. But this didn't this wouldn't really do anything, it's just a blank script, right? So then we also set its script text uh with a variety of new script text commands, and this is what it gets set to. So basically that would be like if we put this in here. <clears throat> okay. So this is basically what happens in SPR, right? It creates this script and, and sets it to this contents. So what does the script actually do? Let's walk through this line by line, right? So the first thing here is we have a property called ancestor. Now remember, this is an object, right? So the object has properties. So by saying property ancestor, we're saying, okay, I want this object to have a property called ancestor. But the ancestor keyword is actually a special keyword in lingo. Um, it's sort of similar to the uh, prototype keyword in JavaScript, if you're familiar at all with that. Um, <clears throat> what this means is that we're going to inherit from uh, another script, right? So uh, from another from another object, right? So basically, the gist of this trick is that we are going to use inheritance in order to override the behavior of the enter frame handler, right? <clears throat> so now we have our on new, you know, handler, and we just have to be sure to match the uh, the function signature to the original, right? So if we look back at the original, um, the original time control, it it remember its constructor took in an argument called SPS, right? So <clears throat> We just have to make sure that this matches, right? Um, so back in our time control script, we have made sure that this signature matches, right? And then we set the ancestor. This is the script we're going to, the, the, the object that we're going to inherit from, right? We set it to a new time control script, this time with the underscore, right? So this is the original that we renamed. And we make sure to also pass it 
um, SPS, uh, which was, you know, passed into us. All right. Uh, so again, this is just the syntax that I prefer for creating a new script, but you could also write this line like this. Okay, this would do the exact, or wait, uh, I need an equal sign there. This would do the exact same thing. It is equivalent, right? It, this is just how I prefer to write it, but they do the same thing, right? <clears throat> uh, and so we're basically just taking in this argument, right? And we're just passing it the same way that the other thing, you know, created it. And that way we are ending up with that as the uh, object that we are inheriting from. And then whenever you have uh, and on new, which is like a constructor, you just need to make sure to always end it with return me, because uh, this does not get implicitly added like it would in, in something like JavaScript. So the me keyword in lingo, it's it's very similar to like the this keyword in other languages. It represents the current object. And we have this very uh, like Python uh, esque sort of idea going on here where the first argument to every handler in here will always be me, which, uh, you know, is represents the current object. Uh, and so we can use that to get properties of, of the current object. And it's just always the, when in a parent script, uh, it's always the first, um, always the first arguments to every handler is me, which is, which is like this. It's, it's like the, uh, this, pointer, for, for lack of a better word, right? So um, this is the constructor, you know, it calls new, we set the ancestor to the thing we want to inherit from, and then we just have to make sure to return me. We always have to do this uh, whenever we are writing any on new handler, any constructor, just because it does not get inserted for us implicitly in Lingo. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah. When when you over when you set the um, ancestor right, what this means is that let's say that some other script right it tries to call because remember in our original time control script we have this other handler down here called on handlers that we don't really care about. Uh, now say that something tried to call this right. What that because we've set this original script as our ancestor, what that means is that. Now, when game world, you know, now it's getting this script instead, right? If it tries to call on handlers, uh, it's not, you know, defined here, right? And normally that would cause an error. But because we have the original time control as our ancestor, we are inheriting from it, right? And so it's going to check. It's going to see, oh, this, this script doesn't have an on handlers. So it's going to check on the ancestor, right? It's going to go to the ancestor script, and it's going to see, oh, this has a handlers, right? This has an on handlers um, handler. It's a confusing name, but yeah. Um, and so it'll call it there, and so it'll all work out, right? So what this means is that by setting the ancestor, we don't have to implement every single, you know, handler that we want to, uh, that that is in the original object. Uh, we just have to implement the ones that we actually are interested in changing the behaviors of, right? <clears throat> Which is particularly useful if the original parent script is, is quite complicated, right? Um, so then we have on enter frame. So we're overriding the original enter frame handler here. So now when game world calls the time control dot enter frame, it's going to end up here, right? And then this line here is the same line of code basically that I showed before. The only real difference is that we need to use me dot last ms because last ms right we're inheriting it again we're we're inheriting that from the ancestor and so we just need to make sure to write me dot last ms this would be you know similar to this keyword again uh just to um because otherwise it would be ambiguous whether last ms is supposed to be a local variable or if it's meant to be um you know on on the object, right? So we just need to make sure to write me.lastms so that we can use the inherited one. But otherwise, this is basically the same fix that we saw before, right? And then we need to call call ancestor um, in order to call the original enter frame that was on the original object. Now, you might think, why couldn't we just do like enter frame here, right? Because we inherited it. So shouldn't we be able to just call enter frame 
But the problem with this is that this would be infinitely recursive, right? Because we've also defined an enter frame handler. So this would just call the same handler over and over again until we got a stack overflow, right? So we can't do that. That's why we have to use call ancestor here, which is just a thing built into director. And this allows us to call enter the enter frame method on like the base class, basically, right? Uh, so we do that. And then that basically ca causes um, this to get called. So the original code happens, right? <clears throat> so putting this all together, right? Um, what would happen is that in game world, right? It's going to new the time control script, which is our own script now, because we renamed the original. So this is going to create our scripts, right? And then it's going to call new, it's going to call our new. That sets the, the ancestor so that we will inherit from the original. And then later on, when it does time control dot enter frame, that is going to go to here, to our enter frame. We set last ms to be at least a millisecond to go, right? So that that way it will be guaranteed that the next line of code immediately after will not cause it to divide by zero. We call the original enter frame event. And then in here, this line of code runs and last ms, we just set it to make sure that it's at least a millisecond to go, right? So now this will not cause a divide by zero, right? Uh, so now, you know, all you would need to do is just take that script, format it correctly, right? You would need to just put it in like the new script text tags there. And then we can run it. So let me just, you know, undo all that formatting. Put that launch command in. It doesn't crash. So yeah, clearly this is lasting much longer than before. So we can be pretty sure that we fixed it. <clears throat> All right. So side note, right? Uh, you might remember that Flashpoint actually has a utility called Old CPU Simulator, which uh, you might think could fix this type of issue because it makes games run slower. And so, in theory, right, because the game is running slower, uh, it would not, you know, have this like milliseconds issue because it would be running slow enough, you know, that it would not, um, that it would never encounter that race condition. Unfortunately, in this particular case, that is not true, because, right, this issue is a sub-millisecond uh, timing precision issue. Um, so, old CPU simulator is only accurate to the nearest millisecond, to the nearest one millisecond. And that's actually an operating system limitation. It's a Windows limitation, because on Windows, the highest timer resolution that you can get is to the nearest one millisecond. If you want to measure time any more precisely than that, you need to busy wait. And busy waiting is really bad because what that means is that you're maxing out a processor core, so you're going to be draining battery power, you know, and it's just, and, and using a lot of CPU for no reason. Uh, and so it's just bad. So old CPU simulator doesn't do that, but it means that if there is a race condition that occurs, you know, over a course of time that is longer than a millisecond, then it can reliably fix it. But in a case like this, where uh, it is, it requires sub millisecond precision, then it it is not reliable. It will reduce the chances of it happening. So you might be able to get further in the game that you normally would, but it is not 100% reliable. It will not completely eliminate the bug. And that can be like a really good test, right? If you just run something in old C old CPU simulator and it seems to last longer than before, but the error still occurs, right? Then that's a very good indication that 
this is the type of bug that you are encountering, right? Uh, and so, and so you need to go in and, and fix it, right? Uh, and so you know kind of what to look for. So <clears throat> that's basically an introduction to uh, director lingo ha hacking. Uh, if you have any questions, then just um, let me know. Uh, but yeah, I think I covered everything that that I wanted to say. Uh, so yeah, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.